Hi, I'm Paul Shari, I'm director of the 20 YY Warfare Initiative here at CNAS. Um, there we go, that's what I was waiting on. What I'd like to talk with you about today is an ongoing revolution in warfare. Now, militaries have always sought the latest technological advances in war, from the English longbow to the rifled musket to the rifle optics and night vision goggles that I carried as I walked through the mountains of Afghanistan and the streets of Iraq. Today, we stand on the cusp of a revolution in robotics. Robots are finding their way into factories, highways, our homes, and they will play a significant role on the battlefield. The US military has a lead in unmanned systems today, but that lead is fragile. Experts estimate that by 2018, global defense spending on military robotics will top $7.5 billion a year. At that same time, global spending on commercial and industrial robotics will exceed $40 billion a year. Now, the technologies that undergird US military supremacy today, like stealth and GPS, came from the US defense establishment. How does the US military sustain its superiority when some of the most game-changing innovations will come from the commercial sector and will be widely available to everyone? Uncovering some of the most game-changing uses of that technology will be critical. The US military has used unmanned systems to great effect in the most recent conflicts. With thousands of air and ground robots patrolling the skies and defusing bombs, they have saved countless lives. US military investments in unmanned systems have increased dramatically over the last decade, but they are still relatively small as a slice of the overall DOD budget. Only one out of every 20 R&D and procurement dollars is spent on unmanned systems. Now, this would make sense if they were only useful in niche roles in the future, like reconnaissance or bomb disposal. In fact, as unmanned systems incorporate greater autonomy and approach true robotic systems, they will be increasingly useful in a range of missions in all domains on the battle space. Some have compared unmanned systems to where tanks and aircraft were at the end of World War I, where they had been used in a small way in that conflict. But their true potential on the battlefield would be seen 20 years later in World War II with the advent of the Blitzkrieg. But rather than just assert that's the case, what I want to do is walk you through some specific examples of challenges the US military is facing and will face in the future and how unmanned systems can address those challenges. Today, the US military faces a range of emerging threats from state and non-state actors. These include long-range precision strike weapons that threaten traditional US modes of power projection anti-satellite weapons that target vulnerable US satellites in space that move through predictable orbits, and precision strike weapons in the hands of non-state actors, like manned portable air defense systems, anti-tank guided missiles, and even swarms of low-cost drones that could be purchased commercially and outfitted with explosives could operate as flying IEDs. Unmanned systems can help address these challenges because their ability to take additional risk and their longer endurance. What I'd like to do now is walk you through some specific scenarios and give some examples. US fifth generation fighter aircraft are the best in the world, but their diminishing numbers combined with the tyranny of distance means that they are likely to be outnumbered by potential adversaries in future conflicts. Unmanned systems can help address this challenge by bringing additional sensors and missiles into the fight at relatively low cost. This can be done because of their longer endurance. A single seat manned fighter aircraft can stay in the air, the aircraft for long periods of time, but the pilot for 12 to 14 hours and still remain combat capable. Unmanned aircraft, not tied to the limits of human endurance, can remain in the air with aerial refueling for 40 to 50 hours at a time. Now what this means is that in order to sustain the same amount of combat power forward, fewer total aircraft are needed saving billions of dollars. In addition, they can be operated at lower cost in peacetime because costly flying hours will not be needed in the future to maintain the currency of pilots. Future unmanned aircraft will have flight controls that are increasingly automated as pilots shift to controllers. Without a seat of the pants feel to be gained from actually being in the aircraft, high fidelity simulators can be used, saving costly flying hours for large scale exercises and real world operations. And this also would save billions of dollars over the life cycle of a program. The Air Force concept for this is called Loyal Wingmen and is captured in a visionary document released by the Air Force just this spring. 
However, the Air Force plan to build a next generation unmanned aircraft, the MQX, was canceled in 2012. And like many examples that I'll walk through, that disconnect between the vision and the funding is, of course, what will be the main limiting factor in this idea moving forward. Similarly, US destroyers are incredibly capable combat assets with the ability to project power from sea onto land with Tomahawk land to crack cruise missiles. And ballistic missile defense ships have the ability to provide an umbrella for US ships, bases, allies, and partners anywhere around the globe against ballistic missile threats. But they are limited in their magazine capacity. With only a limited number of vertical launching system cells with which to hold missiles, commanders must make difficult choices about the balance of offensive and defensive missiles before leaving port, and they ultimately risk having not enough of either. Now, the US Navy is testing a low cost per shot electromagnetic railgun that could be a game changer for ballistic missile defense. The Navy will test this weapon at sea in 2016. And if successful, it will allow the Navy to fire a large number of slugs at incoming missiles at very low cost. Unmanned missile barges could also be used to expand both defensive and offensive striking capacity for existing ships at relatively low cost. Because there would be no people on board, they need not be combat-capable warships, but would merely be extra magazines for existing destroyers. In fact, commercial shipping companies have recently expressed interest in building large unmanned cargo ships for commercial shipping. Now this concept is new. Many countries around the globe are investing in small unmanned surface vessels, but not large ones yet. But the commercial shipping industry is already starting to invest money in some of the underlying technologies that might make this possible. Unmanned aircraft can also be used to reach deep inside enemy air defenses. And because of their longer endurance, persist there for long periods of time. This will allow them to track hard to find mobile targets like enemy mobile missile launchers. They could autonomously jam enemy radars, employ non-kinetic weapons like high powered microwaves, and when they find those hard to find targets, reload those coordinates back to human controllers who authorize them for strikes. The Navy is currently developing an unmanned carrier launched aircraft called U-Class that will be the follow-on to the Navy's experimental X-47B aircraft that recently made a historic landing on an aircraft carrier. Now, lawmakers have recently expressed concern over the direction the Navy is heading with their U-Class program, because what the Navy is currently building is not this aircraft. The Navy's current plans call for a maritime surveillance, surveillance excuse me, aircraft that will not have the range, payload, or stealth necessary to accomplish this mission. Now, the Navy will release their final requirements for their program later this summer, so when they do so, we'll see if they're responsive to lawmakers' concerns. Cruise missiles in the future will be increasingly networked and autonomous, which will enable US forces to unlock the power of swarming. Now, a large number of missiles is not a swarm. That's a deluge. But networked cooperative autonomous systems can all game-changing effects in the battlefield. They can allow uh, the ability to attack targets coordinated, simultaneously coming from multiple directions, and synchronizing electronic warfare attacks along with kinetic attacks. With onboard sensors, they can perform battle damage assessment of a target before striking, which will allow the same number of missiles to strike a larger number of targets with the same assured probability of kill. Both manned and unmanned aircraft in these future environments will need communications links in order to fight and operate as a network. US satellites will be vulnerable to a range of kinetic and non-kinetic disruption. High altitude, long endurance unmanned aircraft can operate as pseudo satellites or pseudo lights, performing a redundant backup layer to space. The Air Force, in fact, has already proven this concept with two existing Global Hawk unmanned aircraft that have communications relays. Now, two aircraft is not sufficient to make an entire network of pseudo lights. The Air Force has a plan to build such a network called the Joint Aerial Layer Network. And last year, it was reported that it was fighting for funding within the Air Force. Elements of JALIN, as it is called, are funded within the Air Force, including communications links between existing manned aircraft, but not an entire network of pseudo lights. 
U.S. surface ships face threats from enemy swarming small boats that could overwhelm from multiple directions at the same time. Unmanned surface vessels could be used to counter this threat by interdicting them from a distance away from U.S. ships. In 2012, the Navy tested the ability to launch a missile from an unmanned surface vessel, demonstrating this concept. Many countries around the world are developing unmanned surface vessels, including the U.S. Navy, for countermine operations, but not currently for ship defense. Similarly, swarms of low-cost drones could be used to attack U.S. ships or U.S. ground forces. The Navy is developing a low-cost-per-shot laser weapon and will test one at sea later this year. This would allow the ability to shoot down these drones at very low cost, not uh, much less expensive than uh, using a missile. Another method has been proposed and which the Navy is currently researching are counter swarms of low cost expendable unmanned aircraft that could be launched from US ships or ground bases. Now this is a different paradigm for the US Department of Defense that typically invests in large, exquisite, and expensive multi-mission systems in very few numbers. The US Air Force recently launched a plan to investigate potential uses for small unmanned aircraft. So when that plan is released, look to see whether or not it includes the concept of large numbers of expendable aircraft. US ground forces will face threats in the future for precision strike weapons in the hands of non-state actors. These include anti-tank guided missiles, guided rockets, artillery, and mortars, and swarms of low-cost drones. Ground robotic systems can help by being the vanguard of an advance. When making a movement to contact, it should be the robots making contact with the enemy. They can flush out enemy forces and take risks that commanders would not be willing to take with manned tanks or ground vehicles. Most importantly, these can be built at very low cost using existing platforms that are already in the US inventory. The Army has thousands of Humvees and M113 armored personnel carriers that will not use in future conflicts because they are not survivable enough in this threat environment to have humans inside. But they would be survivable enough for robotic systems. Because they could be built at low cost using robotic applique kits that apply sensors and autonomy to existing platforms, large numbers of them could be built. If they were lost on the battlefield, that would be acceptable. They would be expendable, replaceable, and no human lives would be lost. The Army currently has medium altitude unmanned aircraft that it uses for reconnaissance, close air support, and communications links. In the future, these aircraft will be increasingly autonomous, allowing one person to control a swarm of unmanned aircraft. These could be used to cover ground forces as a self-healing mobile network, adjusting to bandwidth requirements, and tasking of reconnaissance missions by ground forces. Now, the Army has recently expressed interest in using robotic systems to offset what will inevitably be a smaller Army in the future. The Army is heavily invested in small unmanned ground vehicles for bomb disposal and reconnaissance, as well as larger vehicles for reconnaissance, or excuse me, uh, for bomb disposal. And the Army is currently investigating applique kits for cargo vehicles to get soldiers off of roads. But some of these concepts, like using ground vehicles for maneuver warfare, only exist on the drawing board and are not currently funded within the Army. These touch on core missions of the Army. So as the Army begins to flesh out its concept, we'll see whether it includes robotic systems in these roles. Undersea is one of the few areas where the United States has tremendous advantages today. It can put a US submarine right off an enemy's coast, launch Tomahawk land attack cruise missiles, and in the future, even UAVs. Unmanned systems can help sustain and press forward this advantage by tracking enemy submarines and ships. Undersea pods can be seeded into a battle space ahead of time and on order launch unmanned vehicles or even unmanned aircraft that float to the surface and then launch. This is another area, again, where commercial innovation is driving much of the technology. Oil and gas industries are heavily invested in autonomous undersea vehicles. And so this technology will be widely available to a range of actors. In order to stay ahead undersea, the US military will need to invest aggressively in undersea under vehicles. The Navy is moving out in this area, but it also has not been immune to recent budget pressures. 
Collectively, unmanned systems can be used in a wide range of missions across the battlefield, in all domains, and against a range of potential threats. Now, many of these concepts are not new. They are captured in various vision or roadmap documents throughout, that have been released by the Department of Defense. Two, in fact, were released in just the last six months. A DOD-wide roadmap that came out in December of last year, and an Air Force document articulating the future direction for, as the Air Force calls them, remotely piloted aircraft. Now, these documents represent what might be possible in the future with unmanned systems. But the most important document to be released by the US Department of Defense in the last six months, and what will lay out what actually is the plan for the future, is the DOD budget. As I've alluded to in many of these examples, there's often a disconnect between what is in these vision documents and what is actually funded in the budget. Now, all new programs, unmanned or not, face challenges inside the Department of Defense for funding. They need to fight an uphill battle for funding against existing programs and entrenched bureaucratic interests. But culture also plays a significant role in decisions about what gets funded and what does not. Money is tight at the Department of Defense, but what initiatives receive funding reflect choices by senior military and civilian leaders, and those choices are shaped by culture and bureaucracy. To give one example, I want to talk about how the Army and the Air Force use their unmanned aircraft differently. The Air Force has the MQ-1B Predator, and the Army the MQ-1C Gray Eagle. Now, to a layperson, they would look indistinguishable. It's the Air Force one on top. They are built by the same contractor, based on the same underlying technology, but they implement that technology differently, and most importantly, they are used very differently. The Air Force uses officers to fly their unmanned aircraft. The Army uses enlisted personnel. In fact, it's not really appropriate to call the Army personnel pilots. They're controlling the aircraft. The aircraft, in fact, fly themselves, the Army aircraft. They take off and land on their own. They can fly point to point, and the person controlling them directs them where to go. Air Force aircraft, on the other hand, are flown by a pilot in a mock cockpit on the ground with a stick and rudder. There are other differences as well. The Air Force flies their aircraft remotely from the United States. The Army forward deploys their personnel. What this means is that for the Army, roughly two people are needed for every one deployed so that they can rotate the personnel. They can't obviously keep them deployed indefinitely. Now, what the Army could do is adopt a hybrid concept, where in addition to deploying their personnel, when they're back in the States and they're not performing other training or spending time with their families between deployments, they could support real-world operations remotely. What this would enable the Army to do is provide additional combat power at very low cost, use, leveraging existing aircraft and people that it already has in the force. Moreover, this would help those pilots or controllers, as they are, maintain currency, and they could, in fact, even maybe support operations in the area they're going to deploy. But the Army has not embraced this concept. What the Army is doing is they are moving out on multi-aircraft control and will field a ground control station next year that has the ability to allow one person to control two aircraft at the same time. This is possible because of the high degree of automation in their aircraft. This is a baby step towards swarming in the future where one person will control many vehicles. The Air Force, on the other hand, sees multi-aircraft control as a decade after next technology. The Air Force experimented with early versions of multi-aircraft control and found the human machine interfaces and the human task loading unsatisfactory and overwhelming for pilots. Again, less automated in their aircraft. Now, in 2010, Secretary Gates directed the Air Force to develop improved multi-aircraft control to overcome these concerns and improve the technology. And he included the funding to do so in the DOD budget, but it has not been developed. Culture shapes choices about how militaries look at new technologies and what uses are perceived to be appropriate or not useful. Examples abound throughout military history. Elements of the Navy initially re resisted the transition from sail to steam-powered ships. Parts of the Army resisted the transition from horses to tanks. It was the cavalry. And perhaps most infamously, the Army went so far as to court-martial early air power advocate Billy Mitchell. In some cases, these choices are implicit in where service priorities lie for investment. 
In other cases, they are quite explicit. Casualty evacuation seems like an area that would be ripe for unmanned vehicles. Almost by definition, casualties are likely to occur in dangerous areas. Unmanned vehicles could be built at low cost and seated forward into the battle space to shorten the time from point of injury to when those casualties reach a higher standard of care, which is critical in improving their odds of surviving. In fact, the military has already invested in unmanned cargo aircraft and is purchasing more, like the KMAX helicopter that is currently deployed in Afghanistan. And there may be situations where this could be used to carry wounded personnel back when there are no other alternatives. But not only is the military not investing in modifications necessary to make those possible and safe to transport casualties, but the Army actually has an explicit policy against it. Now, there are concerns with placing wounded personnel aboard unmanned vehicles. These include safety and continuity of care. But a comprehensive three-year NATO study that included US service members looked at these concerns and ultimately concluded that there were some situations where placing a wounded person aboard an unmanned vehicle would not be appropriate, but that there are others where that may be the only way to save that person's life. And a blanket prohibition did not make sense. Nevertheless, the Army has reinforced its policy with not one, not two, but three memorandums, the most recent one released this spring. Now, I want to be clear. I am not suggesting that militaries as a whole are resistant to innovation. Sometimes that's a caricature that's made of militaries. I don't believe that the history of adoption of unmanned systems supports that, nor do I believe based on my personal experiences in uniform in the Army or the five years I spent working these issues as a civilian in the Pentagon that that's the case. What is true is that change for all of us is hard when it impacts our core identity. When the Navy transitioned from sail to steam, what was at stake was not a new technology, but the essence of what it meant to be a sailor. When being a sailor no longer meant climbing the mast and working the rigging, but now working down in an engine room, being an engineer. And of course, as we know in our daily lives, new technology often does not work well at first. One empathizes with the US Army cavalrymen of the interwar period who looked at horses that had been used reliably by military for thousands of years and looked at the tank, which was arguably a new and unproven technology. Of course, if the US Army had not adopted tanks, the history of the 20th century might have been very different. These issues are explored in our new report, Robotics in the Battlefield, Part 1, Range, Persistence, and Daring. It includes key recommendations for action for the US Department of Defense to take positive steps forward in these areas including incremental technology development and experimentation to overcome some of these concerns. Culture and bureaucracy cannot be swept aside, but they must be addressed through the ability to build trust with new technologies over time and improve those technologies. Innovation is a core theme of the US QDR, but support for innovative ideas is needed if those sentiments are to be anything more than words on a paper. That includes funding, and again, the issue is the balance of investments across the department's portfolio, one out of every $20 currently spent. But it also includes support for some of these challenging concepts of operation. The 20 YY Warfare Initiative will examine these and other new concepts of operation that robotics might bring to the battlefield. Robotics in the Battlefield Part 2 will be released this fall and will examine swarming and the ability for large numbers of robotic systems that are networked and cooperative to bring game-changing effects in the battlefield. We will also continue to more closely examine costs associated with unmanned systems, where they may cost more and where they may cost less than equivalent manned systems. The emerging robotics warfare regime also raises challenging policy and strategy questions, many of which are not in the distant future. Just last year, China flew a drone into contested airspace in the East China Sea. And in response, Japan scrambled an F-15 fighter. Now, if one country shoots down another country's drone, is that an act of war? Perhaps most troubling, would a country be more willing to shoot one down because there are no humans on board? And in fact, would countries be more willing to place a drone in harm's way in the first place because they're not risking anyone? There are no easy answers to these questions, but policymakers should consider them before the heat of a crisis. 
Closer to home, unmanned systems raise challenging questions about the use of force and war powers. Does the war powers resolution apply to unmanned systems? In Libya, the Obama administration asserted it did not. Now, there are arguments on either side of this debate, but the key thing is that if unmanned systems are going to be used in a wide variety of roles in the future, then the implications of that decision are quite profound. The 20YY Warfare Initiative will explore these and other areas, including ethical autonomy, the balance of human and machine decision making in many areas, particularly in the use of force. The robotics revolution is coming. It will be driven by innovation in the commercial sector. And the stakes in understanding this emerging warfare regime are high. Military history is littered with examples of militaries that failed to adapt to new technologies and lost battles or even wars as a result. It is important for any military that wants to stay ahead to be able to adapt to this technology and in particular the new concepts that it unlocks. The winner of the robotics revolution will not be who develops the technology first or even the best technology, but who comes up with the best ways of using it. Thank you. OK, I think we have a couple minutes for questions. And there should be someone running around with microphones. Yes. And please introduce yourself. Charlie Dunlap from Duke Law School. Paul, you seem to be very confident that the data link that is necessary would be robust enough against a first world, world adversary. Uh, are, you, are you sure that that's, that that's going to be true? And then the, the second question, you know, the world has turned against autonomous weapon systems. That's why we have the Ottawa Convention. And why do you think that the world is going to embrace a system, any network system is going to have to have a fully autonomous mode, I believe, because I don't think the data link can be reliably, <clears throat> you know, kept in place over the course of a, in a contested environment. Why do you think that the world will suddenly turn around? It's not a matter, so much a matter of ethics, but a matter of law and what the world community seems to, to want. Thanks. No, that's, uh, you hit on really one of the core vulnerabilities of unmanned systems. Um, the main limitation in taking a person out of some kind of vehicle is, of course, you lose the cognitive abilities of that person. And so they're replaced by some mixture of autonomy, and then your communications links back to some human controller. Um, currently, our aircraft are entirely vulnerable to really what are quite fragile communications links. Um, they require a high amount of bandwidth, and if you cut those communications links, the aircraft we have are not very smart, if you will. Um, they can you know, fly in an orbit at a particular point in space. More sophisticated ones, like the Global Hawk, can go fly to a place and land. Um, there's a lengthy section in the report that talks about this, but it's really a mixture of increased autonomy and getting the bandwidth requirements down. So the bandwidth requirements for command and control of the aircraft are actually relatively limited. The bulk of the bandwidth is needed for today, we're streaming high definition full motion video back. That's, that requires a tremendous amount of bandwidth. Command and control for the vehicle is actually about an order of magnitude less than that. So if you can do additional data processing on board, or if you can um, come up with methods where you don't need to actually stream back full motion video. So let's say, for example, in this scenario we have a vehicle hunting mobile missile launchers. You don't really need to see every single image. What you need to see is if you can build an onboard processing that's good enough to cue you to what might be a mobile missile, then you send back a picture of that and the surrounding area and the geolocation coordinates back to a human controller. So you can reduce those, those bandwidth requirements significantly. There's costs associated with that. Um, you know, one of the key things in staying ahead in this area is going to be the ability to pull in commercial sector innovation. Um, and so, you know, you want a paradigm where you're able to rapidly update both your hardware and software to leverage the technological, you know, basically the computer processing power that's continually advancing. You don't want to have to build some of the software you have to do yourself, but you don't want to have to do all of that on your own, and you don't want to be 10 years behind the power curve. To your other question about um, autonomy, this is something we're going to continue to explore. Um, this was recently discussed uh, at the UN Convention on Conventional Weapons in Geneva last month. There's a campaign to ban killer robots, not to find exactly what that is, but it seems really frightening and a bad idea. Um, the paradigm that, that we talk about is ethical autonomy. 
And so there are military operational concerns. There's certainly moral and ethical concerns. There are safety. There are law of war concerns. Um, I think the right model is that you have machines doing machi things that you can trust a machine to do, navigation, maybe queuing a person to a target. But people are making the decisions that people must make, and in particular, selection of particular targets for the use of force. There's another question. Yes, sir. I'm Doug Samuelson from Group W, a small consulting and R&D firm yes. here in the area. How much have you thought about the other resources that go into operating and maintaining UAVs? You've got training, you've got maintenance, you've got software, uh, you've got retrieval because even though in theory you may never care about retrieving them, in practice in many cases you do. Uh, any thoughts? Yeah, no, so I mean all of the history of um, innovation and warfare suggests that it's not really about the technology. It's about how militaries decide to use the technology whether they incorporate the right training, uh, the right organizational structures to adapt. There are many examples of scenarios where you have militaries that you know, had some element of the technology but really never sort of figured out how to change their concept of operations. So that's ultimately really the core issue behind it. Um, if you maybe have the widget but you're using it the wrong way or you haven't trained people appropriately, it's not ultimately going to be successful. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hello, I'm John Hanley. I was a former submariner, and we used to be pretty autonomous in the old days. Yes. And when we were operating anywhere near our forces, we had lots of problems with blue-on-blue -blue attack. Uh, we knew where we were. Our submarine operating authority knew where we were, but the rest of the force didn't. And then you get into a coalition environment where you got water space management issues, where you got lots of other forces with submarines, or countries with submarines out there. Have you thought through the command and control, not of just controlling you know, multiple aircraft, but force command and control, and particularly in a coalition environment where you have you know, many nations that are your allies that don't have the same air picture, et cetera, et cetera? No, I think that's a great question. Um, so yeah, there's sort of two components of that. One is, as you start to have lots of vehicles, and today the technology is really people have done you know, a handful, small single digit numbers of vehicles operating together, sometimes across multiple domains, so maybe air and ground vehicles together. As that starts to increase, what's the human command and control paradigm? How do you control a swarm? What does that mean? What does that look like? That's something we're going to continue to explore. Your question, um, the other part, mostly just about interoperability. Um, one of the things people are working very hard on is even among our own uh, vehicles that exist today, they're not interoperable, they have different communications links, they have different sensors, they have different uh, control mechanisms. The services are moving out, at least for ourselves, to ensure that we have common control mechanisms. So that if you give something to uh, a soldier marine on the ground, you give them one thing, not like 10 different tablets they gotta control. Uh, and similarly, they're experimenting with sort of a common ground control station architecture for, um, for unmanned aircraft. Now the the plus side is, if we can get to up to place, and this is challenging today, where we can export some of these technologies, then if allies and partners are using what we have, then that solves some of that problem. There are training aspects and doctrine aspects. Um, if you get to the place where we say this is, we, this is ours and nobody can have it, even if you're a close ally, and everyone's building their own, that's really going to be an uphill struggle. Yeah. Yes, uh, someone way in the back. I don't know if we got a microphone near you. Thank you. Uh, Eric Larson, uh, currently on the joint staff as an Air Force officer. Um, two questions. How does the Google car play into all of this? And then also, how did generational differences in how my generation, previous generations, and future generations, how comfortable will we be with some of the new technology on the, bad on the battlefield? I mean, there's the Google car in the general population, but then the, specific generational differences? Sure, so um, on the Google car, first of all, it's an interesting example. On the one hand, here's a technology that you could see um, importing in many ways from the commercial sector. You know, I think when you think about how to have a military that is um, positioned to take advantage of these adaptations, you wanna think about different types of investment. What are areas that you can draw in what's already being made with some modifications? 
What are areas where you take the underlying technology that maybe enables it, but you have to build things your own? So for example, the Navy landed an aircraft on an aircraft carrier. That landing mechanism, you're not going to buy off the shelf somewhere. You have to build that. Um, and where are things that really the fundamental research is going to have to be done by the department, things like directed energy weapons, laser weapons. Um, one of the, the so, so when you think about this, you say, all right, uh, maybe we can just buy a self-driving car. We don't have to build our own. Now, in fact, what Google's done is they've used uh, LiDAR, it's like a laser sensing mechanism, uh, to basically map the area around Google, the Silicon Valley environment, to a high degree of fidelity, down to allegedly like one centimeter, you know, and curb height and things like this. Now, that's obviously overseas. You're not going to have that luxury. And so that's a huge difference. Um, and so there are limitations when you take um, they actually, this story, the, the sort of term for this is the kidnapped robot problem. So you have this robot and it's operating in this environment that you've mapped out, but if you take it and put it in some new place, it's just, it's hopeless sometimes. Um, so there may be places where, you know, there needs to be some new investment, you know, GPS for the environments we're going to operating in, maybe not reliable. Um, in terms of generational challenges, there are probably issues certainly about uh, trust for autonomy, one of the interesting things that's come out in, um, in research about how a person controls a swarm of autonomous agents, and in many cases this is done digitally uh, right now through simulations, is that personality preferences matter a lot. So what you ideally want is you want someone that understands the problem, the environment that you're operating in, and they understand the algorithms that the agents are running, and they know when they will succeed and solve the problem optimally, and when they might fail and the person has to intervene. Well, that requires, you know, understanding the environment, requires understanding the technology, but also requires like sort of the appropriate level of trust. And so that's a, a nascent area because you don't want someone that is overly trusting and they sit back and then the machine fails and they don't do anything. And you don't want someone that intervenes too much and then to lead to a suboptimal solution. Um, so I think there's probably a lot of potential there where people are just more comfortable with new technology. Um, but there are probably also a lot of interesting areas to better understand what exactly is the right skill set uh, to perform those kind of jobs. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. And also uh, uh, the SDM MIT graduation graduate program. Um, just a couple things, and I just want your opinion on it. Um, I notice a lot of people use interchangeably unmanned versus autonomous, but autonomous is autonomous and not unmanned. And two major characteristics of autonomous that I notice is right now it's okay to have an autonomous swarm if they're all identical siblings, if you know what I mean. In other words, they all have the same knowledge base. It's right. like, hello, my name is Albert, hello, my name is Albert, yeah. hello, my, you know. And the other thing is, is that obstacles. I don't know, your opinion? Mm -hmm. No, good question. So, um, all right, so just on terminology. So you have unmanned systems, which is a person's not on the platform or on whatever, whatever the object is. Um, those could be remotely controlled. They could be autonomous. They could be semi-autonomous. Um, robotic systems have both attributes. There's not a person on board, and then they have some level of autonomy. You can, of course, also have automated functions on vehicles that have people on board. So the Air Force has something called automated ground collision avoidance on some of their aircraft, um, where if a pilot's about to engage in controlled flight into terrain, the aircraft takes over and flies at the last possible minute. Um, in terms of, sort of swarming behavior, what's really interesting is when you look at sort of nature for examples, where you have simple rules with things like ants and bees and termites that can have these really um, intelligent looking emergent behaviors that come out of them. A colony acting very intelligent. Um, they can exhibit a very intelligent sort of behaviors in terms of finding new nests or hives rather for bees, uh, building objects for termites, foraging for food. Uh, those are all homogeneous groups. Um, one of the things that you can do with robotic systems is they can be heterogeneous and you have a different mix. Uh, there's, and this is very new, there's some groups um, that have started work on this. There's one called a, a, an organization built something called a Swarmanoid. It's like, a, it's got a swarm of robots and there's like hand robots and flying eye robots and leg robots and they come together to build some sort of creature that does things. Um, it's it's kind of interesting. Very nascent in, from a research perspective. Um, your second question, I'm sorry. Oh, obstacles, yes. So um, 
when it comes through, you know, so undersea vehicles or aircraft, uh, this is obviously much, much, much easier. In the ground domain, autonomy in terms of navigation is still really lagging behind. Again, Google's able to do what they're doing because they're mapping the environment. Um, negative obstacles, so just the potholes, is really a problem for unmanned vehicles to identify that. Um, so, you know, the DARPA Grand Challenge where um, vehicles navigate across the desert was several years ago now. But it's still a challenge to do, particularly if you imagine uh, robotic vehicles moving through forests and there are many obstacles and they might get entangled. Um, so it's something that's going to require a lot of work. There may be opportunities there to sort of combine those concepts. So you have maybe like an air vehicle overhead that's launched from a ground robot that's providing another set of eyes. Um, and people are working on early stages of cooperative air and ground vehicles working together. Okay, I think we've got to go. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it.